market for whatever reason equates size and color with quality and almost everything or certainly given the choice between two otherwise identical fruit whether it's a granny smith or a fuji or a peach or a cherry they're going to go with the bigger redder one you know 99 times or certainly nine times out of ten and and so this was a market driven event so you can see we went from a peak of this but what did that do if you just do the pure math and this is pure math not taking into account college and those sorts of things but this was the kind of crop load we were leaving in the mid 80s about a thousand fruit per tree and this is probably an accurate number still today because we've learned that well not we don't grow much oh henry anymore but you can say the fruit load was cut in half and we really only moved the distribution a little bit but you can see we cut our production by a third you know so what we really did was we didn't grow a whole lot more of the bigger fruit in terms of absolute numbers and this is an important a really important concept to remember we didn't grow more in terms of absolute numbers so we didn't grow if we go back to that slide these are percentages we didn't necessarily grow more of these 30s we just grew a higher percentage because we chopped this end off and we were dividing by a different number okay so you can get to the point where you thin those trees to 50 fruit per tree and they don't grow any more of these per acre in terms of total absolute number of boxes and that's again an important concept to remember and that's why i tell people when you plant a new variety or a new orchard in a new location and you're trying to figure out where you fall on these size distribution curves it's always good in that third or fourth fifth growing season while you're while you're tuning your brain and your your farming skills to take two or three trees and thin them twice as hard at least twice as hard thin them to 50 or 100 fruit per tree say if you're leaving 500 or a thousand and that will show you the absolute maximum size you can possibly get and once you know that your say 300 or 500 or 700 number is giving you a lot of those size fruit you can realize hey there's no point in going from 700 to 350 because i'm not going to grow a whole lot because even on my tree with 50 that's the biggest i'm seeing and, and, and if you don't remember anything else about fruit growth and and what i'm talking about i'd, I'd use that as a as a take-home lesson so again we all should know this the relationship between crop load and sugars as as you put more fruit on a tree or in terms of number of fruit per acre your in any given year your crop your your, your soluble solids go down but you can also see oh oh henry in one year and oh henry a year later tremendous difference so there are seasonal effects you know what was what was the spring doing and and all that and i'll talk some about that in my in my next talk um and and this is kind of the inverse of that slide this is soluble solids and in terms of fruit size so in general the larger your fruit the sweeter it's going to be and this is part of what drives that equation from marketers wanting to buy bigger fruit because in general uh, you know 36 size peach is going to be sweeter certainly than a 64 or something like that a smaller size peach and so fruit growth and development we've got several things going on in terms of growth fruit size you've got the photosynthates the plants produce the sugars and all that and that is a light driven for the most part event okay it's not temperature driven so you go out on a day like this and you know again provided it hadn't frozen you know dropped all the leaves on the ground you've got a light rich environment even though it's it's cold and and photosynthesis this, the rate of photosynthesis is not as affected by temperature as as fruit growth or maturity is and so you've got these photosynthates the sugars driven by light and the tree can do all sorts of things to it it can shunt them into into fruit it can put it into shoots you can put it into root growth it can put it into all those things basic metabolic functions respiration what have you and our challenge is to get it to put as much of that into what we care about fruits now fruit maturity is a completely 
different process. It isn't driven by photosynthesis nearly as much, if at all. It's heat dependent. And it's the heat, the first, depending on where you live and what your springs are like, that sort of thing. It's the first 30 to 40, for us, it's 30 to 40 days. But in other places, it might be, you know, you can find some old research out of the east that says it's the first 60 days. But I, I think it's the first 30, say, to 50, 45, something like that, that's the most influential. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, but keep in mind, those are two different things. Yes, sir? Uh, days after bloom, the first 30 to 40, good question, but the first 30, 60 days after bloom, full bloom, are the most influential, okay? So we've got these idealized stone fruit curves, that fruit growth curves that, that uh, probably if you've ever opened a horticultural textbook you've seen, and so you've got what's called phase one of fruit growth and maybe a lag phase, phase two, and then this final swell prior to harvest, and this would be an early season variety. This say would be bloom, and you know uh, May, June, or May, July, and say September. And, and this phase two or stage two is more pronounced in mid and late season varieties. But then they all exhibit this this same final swell to last whatever it is three to five weeks before harvest, depending on on the ripening date, or yeah, the variety. This, this is a complex, but, but yet a very simple slide. And this is some work that Ted DeYoung, who I've done a lot of work with and who I used to work for actually when I started with UC, uh, one, that he and one of his graduate students did in a block I had. This is relative growth rate. It's not important to remember that. What you should look at this slide as, this is after me hearing Ted give this talk about 100. And I was telling Marion last night, Scott Johnson and I listened to Ted give this talk about two dozen times before either of us understood it. And so I, I want to, I hopefully will try and simplify it for you because I don't want you to ever have to listen to me talk about anything 100 times. Uh, except maybe dachshunds, but more about that. This should be looked at as the, the potential fruit growth rate if all things are perfectly aligned on any given day of the year, and so degree days, and this could be looked at as whatever, four weeks after harvest, eight weeks after harvest, you get the point. On, I mean, after bloom, sorry. Um, but early on, these fruit, and it's like anything else, they have a tremendous capacity for growth and doubling. And it's always easier to double something that's 20 than something that's 200, okay? If if they're if they're if they're similar if they're similar units, and so at any given day of the year, this is the idealized maximum, and that max is dropping every day. And why is this important? It's important for two reasons. If you wait too late to thin, if you thin in here, your thinning response is going to be much better than if you thin in here, because then those fruit can grow at that rate. And here, the fruit can only grow at that rate. And you can see it plateaus. And actually, this is, for the most part, stage one. And, and that is stage, stages two and three of the, of the previous slide. And so that's why getting in and thinning early, and, and I recognize there are limitations to that, are, are, more, are, are important. So you want to, these are the take-home lessons of that previous slide. Think of fruit growth as an investment that's compounded over time. It's like, it's like interest. This, whoops, that's what I didn't want to do. Uh, this can also be looked at as the rate of interest any given day. If you, if you go in and deposit bank money in the bank, today you can get 3%, but a, a week later you can only get 2%. A month later you can only get 1%. And it's like now you don't get anything. Um, so, so fruit growth is an investment that's compounded over time. And, and once it's there, you've got it. But if, it's, but if you didn't get it, it can never be recovered. You can never go back to what fruit growth rate was three weeks ago, okay? So that's what I hear. It can never be made up. And so you want to thin early enough so the tree can supply resources to meet the demand, okay? And those fruit are sending out signals. They want to grow. But the tree, if it has a whole bunch of competition, those signals get mixed. And so if you've got 3,000 fruit on that tree, any one fruit signal is obscured by the signals of the other 2,999. But if you thin it 
if you thin it down so that there are only 900 competing, then the noise is lost and that fruit can demand more. And that's why you want to. Those are those are forty five. Those those are forty five with a with a. Oh sure. The, the question was about degree days and, and and what we're using here and how they're calculated and that sort of thing. So those are degree days starting with full bloom from forty five degrees and up, which is what we found the most uh, uh, reliable for California. Which doesn't necessarily mean it wouldn't be forty two or forty seven elsewhere. Uh, so does that. Okay, and there was a question here. Yeah, obviously the, the earliest starting point you could ever think of at thinning would have been by the mean of bloom. Should you thin we're, we're, out of So the question is should you thin at bloom and that complex than a boy that grew up in Dinuba should ever have to. Um, no, not a problem, Marion. Um, so conversely, we want cool springs. We want those first 30 days after bloom to be cool. Why? Because fruit growth is mediated by heat. Photosynthesis isn't. So when you have a cool spring right after, right after bloom, what happens is it's not the first 30 days that are important because the heat accumulation isn't kicking in. It's the first 40 or 45 days. So cooler than average spring will actually give you greater fruit size potential because what happens is that fruit stays on the tree longer. So like, you know, the apple people talk about 150 days, 180 day varieties from bloom to harvest. We don't really do that in the peach world, but we could. But if you, if you have that spring that allows that, that period to be extended, which is what's happening here, you get greater fruit growth because this isn't driven by light. This is a maturity issue driven by heat. Yes. The question is, do they have a lower limit on, on temperatures and too cold a spring? Now for us, we, we have spring frost, but we wouldn't have them like you have. And you know, we can talk about chilling. That's a whole nother hour or two, but, uh, so, so the answer is yes, when you get below 45, probably rough terms, then uh, you'd be, well, again, you kind of put the fruit in suspended animation. So it isn't really bad because again, it's just prolonging that, that turning that first 30 days of critical timing into 40 or 45. And, and again, so it's extending your season by 10 to 15 days really. So it can be looked at as a good thing. And again, this is counterintuitive to what most people think about about fruit growth so is that too much theory and and even leonard nimoy had a dachshund so we, we won't go into all the famous people that had dachshund but we'll go into some of them okay so this is an actual practical experiment with four different varieties we did where we thinned in march and say the standard thinning date for those varieties these are actually canning peach varieties in the middle of may and you can see You've got all these numbers, so I won't belabor in the purpose of, of time, but we either increased or we almost inevitably increased tonnage, except maybe here, but we either increased size or tonnage or both because those fruits in the early thinned trees were not under as much competitive stress. Okay, so is it possible to thin too early? Obviously, it is. Okay, and, and this is kind of kind of what happens if you extrapolate some of these numbers into, into values of about a year or two ago. But early thinning, you know, takes you a little more to thin because you're having to pick through 
big ones and small ones and that sort of thing, which we'll talk about in a second. So you then spend a little more money, a uh, thousand bucks as opposed to 750, and those those numbers can probably have 30% added to them for today in California. But our yield does this, it goes up, and when you split the difference, you're still money ahead by, by practicing early, early thinning. So this is one of my favorite slides, which you can't see, but if you look at your notes, it says predestination. It's not just for theological discussions, okay? <clears throat> this fruit is big. This fruit is big. That fruit is small. Those fruit are in between. So with, with less than an inch or half an inch between them, you've got big fruit and small fruit and medium fruit and big fruit and just a miasma. So there are wheats and there are tares. And this is why we can't do all of our thinning in stone fruits at bloom time like you apple growers with king bloom. You don't realize how lucky you are to have a king bloom in apples that blooms before all the subservient you know, tears that are going to bloom a week later so you can go in and put on chemical thinners that knock those weaker ones off. We have not yet. Scott and Ted and I, I don't think either the two of them are quite as interested in, in this as I am, which I don't know if it says anything about their theological perspective or mine, but I am still trying to figure out why that fruit is big and that fruit next to it is small, despite the fact that they're on adjacent nodes. I mean, you think they got to have access to the same sort of light and, and water and all those things the year before. But because of this, you have to wait until at least some of these fruit declare themselves. And so that usually takes three to five weeks at best after full bloom. And this is why chem or blossom thinning and those sorts of things. And there's Scott doing a blossom thinning trial. And we've done these things over and over again they don't necessarily work, especially very detailed ones, because you don't know if you're thinning off the big fruit or the small fruit. You just don't know. You just don't know. And I'd like to know again why. Um, so you can go in and if you have a whole lot of bloom, sure you can strip 30 or 40% off because if you, if you had something like this, having 30% less fruit would be a good thing. But you could also have done that with a pruning shear, which, which uh, we'll talk about too. And so this, again, short, sort of shows the same sort of thing. I won't belabor it because you have this photograph. And this shows bloom thinning compared to an early April thinning for this variety. So again, about a month after harvest or bloom, 30 days. And you can see no difference at all in fruit size between bloom thinning and a good cultural practice thinning. And you can see fruit size drop-offs and things that were things that were thinned later. And again, this is because waiting that extra two or three weeks, we were able to tell exactly which fruit were gonna be big and we thinned to them. And, and so that's why these, these sorts of mechanical devices or bloom thinning uh, techniques should be looked at more as an augmentation rather than a standalone practice, unless you have no other option. So in California with our labor issues, there are certainly places where uh, our, especially our clean peach growers up in the northern part of the state where they don't have as much labor and in clean peaches for canning there isn't as great a demand or return on investment for producing big fruits so they can go in and do what I would call from a from a fresh market perspective a sloppy thinning job doesn't mean it's sloppy it just means it's sloppy from a different perspective and get by just fine and and of course chemical thinners uh, for us they tend they are caustic products that burn, not plant growth regulators. And so, so even if they do burn off the flowers, far too often they burn off the leaves. And, you know, that isn't good from a, from a maturity or from a, from a fruit size standpoint uh, either. And so I said, the earliest pruning or thinning you can do is with the pruning shear. And, and so that's why if you're going to, with these new varieties, if you're going to dedicate a couple trees to having a light crop, you might want to consider dedicating a couple trees, especially new varieties, new locations, new rootstocks, whatever it might be, things you don't have pragmatic practical experience with, dedicating a couple trees and pruning them 30 or 50% harder. Again, just to see where you are on those curves. So, beg your pardon? I don't know how to do it. I would love to, and I think Marion's been trying to, but she hasn't figured it out either. The top banner, can it be deleted? 
come try. So, so here's Otto, my my current king of the roost, and and so he's wondering where the food is, and and so now we're going to talk uh, momentarily about, about nutrition. Hey, oh, that wasn't it. Anyway, there's Otto. There's the room. I, maybe I should stand here. So there I am. I don't. I'm camera shy, believe it or not. Um, I started out when I was in graduate school primarily interested in plant nutrition. Um, and as I did more and more nutrition work over the years, I became less and less enthralled with, with nutrition work. And I know everybody loves nutrition. Everybody, it was a big word, but, but, but uh, it's still there. Okay, we tried. Thank you, Marianne. But, but if you want to do reducto ad absurdum, as long as you have a canopy that's sufficient to support fruit growth, you shouldn't be looking at, so if you've got this green lush canopy, don't ever look at fill in the blank with, with your element of choice as being the problem solver. <clears throat> hopefully understand some of that from what we just talked about. That canopy and the environment are what are feeding those fruit in terms of maturity and fruit size. And so if you've got this healthy green thing, don't, don't buy into the, to the spray of the wheat club or something in terms of improving your fruit growth. And this is why you should do that experiment, I said, with two or three trees if you're a commercial grower and see just how close to the, to the envelope you're pushing it. Because more often than not, uh, unless we're dealing with true deficiencies, you're, you're, you're not going to see a growth benefit. Quite often what happens is somebody sprays something and the trees either green up a week later, well, because it got warmer and more time went by and the leaves had a chance to do their thing, may have may not had anything to do with the spray or the fruit get bigger, which is what fruit always do every day of the year, they get bigger. Um, and so much of what I'm going to talk about, uh, I, most of my nutrition work has been done in conjunction with Scott, Scott Johnson, you know, our retired extension specialist who now lives here just up the road uh, by Salt Lake. <clears throat> Scott took the point on, on peaches and nectarines for the most part, and I, I did most of my work in plums, just that's how we split it up and, and, and what have you. But, you know, you can look into these sorts of things and talk about them, nutrient use and removal by the crop, and soil and water factors and cation exchange capacity and, and these sorts of things, the consequences of over and under fertilization and uptake efficiency, we're not going to I can't talk about all these things, but it's a complex, complex issue in terms of, of all the parameters that, that are out there. But, but the metaphor I like to use is that because we're, we're dealing with perennial crops here, and fruit trees are totally different, as you, I'm sure you all know, from corn plants or cottons or soybeans, where so much of the dogma in nutrition comes from, annual crops. And so does an annual crop respond to something? Well, it, it very often does, because it's trying to grow a root system and a, a plant, leaves, stems, fruiting body, whatever that might be, unless it's a forage crop and then it's just leaves and stems at the same time. Whereas in fruit trees, once we hit whatever, the third, fourth, fifth year, sixth year, depending on your system and density and all that, your tree has an established root system that isn't really increasing much. And it has an established structure that you're pruning back to the same thing every year. So this is the metaphor. Trees are like locomotives takes a lot of energy to get a locomotive going. So those first couple years are different than maturity. It also takes a lot of energy, just as much energy to get a locomotive going as it does to stop a locomotive once it gets going. And that's why way too often we do experiments in nutrition and me being a very impatient human being, <clears throat> we have to usually wait two or three years when we impose treatments for there to even be a difference between the zeros and our tens or hundreds or two hundreds because trees are like locomotives. And if you go on there on an eight-year-old orchard and impose two different, whatever they are, nutrition regimes, 
there's going to be this carryover, this lag effect before things kick in. And that's why I'm sort of a, not just sort of, I am a skeptic of, of uh, you know, miracle cure fertilizer programs. And so all miracle cure fertilizer program people can kill me, I guess, but that's all right. Then I won't have to sit through the cramped seat this afternoon on the flight to Boise. So you'll actually do me a favor. Um, and hopefully, again, you take a plant nutrition class, you'll learn these things where if a plant is deficient in any given nutrient, you know, you've got severe deficiencies where yield or size or both are affected and mild deficiencies. And then eventually you get into the optimum, you get into where you have way too much, and then finally it gets toxic, okay? Just basic, basic plant nutrition. Um, and then it's also important to keep in mind that some things go up as the season progresses, as the season progresses, yes, and, and some things go down. And, and some things, yeah, change a little bit, but not a whole lot. And, and so this is why if you're testing for certain things and you put on, say, a calcium spray back in April and you take your July samples and you say, wow, they've gone up. Yeah, how about that? And the trees that didn't get sprayed at all went up too, okay, because calcium goes up. Or, wow, we started off at 5% leaf nitrogen in our spring leaf samples and now we're down to three. We better do something. Guess what? The trees that didn't have anything done to them started out at five and went down to three because that's what peach trees do, okay? So keep those things in mind. And you can play this game, nutrient use and removal by crop, which tends to not be bad, but it can oversimplify things. And here, if we gave a tree 100 units of nitrogen a year and here 200, you can see most of, you get a little bit in the fruit, you go from 65 to 80, but most of it goes into the leaves, 40% more, and then the fruit, maybe 30% more. Uh, and it doesn't really change in terms of, of uh, the frame and that sort of thing. Why? Because that's the locomotive. So what's happening in the, in, the, in the leaves? You're just growing more shoots. You're growing more water sprouts. And so if you've got too many water sprouts already, don't look at nitrogen. That's going to stimulate even more water sprouts. Suckers as being the panacea for whatever your fruit size or yield pro problem may be. It very likely is something else. Okay, and you know, plant and soil analysis, everybody should be thinking about doing that. I, uh, you know, in experiments, it's a little different where we tend to take them once or twice or three times a year, depending on what we're trying to prove. From a practical farming standpoint, at home, I would take them maybe every third or fifth year, uh, just because, again, this locomotive effect, and I take them as much to calibrate my eye to say, oh, okay, that's, yes, that's right. That's what it should look like. Or yes, this is what a deficiency looks like than trying to have it be the, the driving force. Um, we tend not to have soil problems in our area. We're in, we're, we're in very rich, uh, maybe even too rich soils. So I don't do a lot of soil testing. Um, again, here's a, here's a photograph of Scott, but this is where I'm talking about the locomotive effect. Young tree goals, Mature tree goals are totally different. So in a young orchard, you want to maximize growth. And so this is, this is a, a very vigorous variety. That's the end of the first growing season. If you know Scott, he's about as tall as I am, 6'4"-ish. And you can see we had a tree there that was 9 or 10 feet tall. This is what we want to do. We want to maximize growth that first year to get it to fill its space as quickly as possible. And yeah, you want balance so that fruiting is maximized in subsequent years. But in a young tree like this, with this kind of growth, the balance is going to be as much internal shading as it is balanced from a fertility standpoint. So, so don't get caught up in that, but this should be your goal to grow a, a, a vigorous young tree. And so this is my personal strategy based up, you know, with, with whatever 40 plus years of, of practical farming experience and, and 35 of, 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 of research experience. In young trees, we want moderate to high nitrogen, okay, because we want to fill that space. For us, we do want high phosphorus, despite the fact I will soon talk about how in mature trees, phosphorus makes no difference. But in a young tree that's establishing a root system we have, I have, I do recommend it, do it on my own stuff, throw in monomonium phosphate or some high phosphate fertilizer, because what's the number one thing that roots want, or one of the number one things that roots want when they're developing is high phosphorus. So if you're building a root system, trying to grow it from here to here, high phosphorus is a good thing. But if you've already got that established tree, you're not going to, we don't ever see a phosphorus response. And we 
tend to want high zinc, which I'll, which I'll illustrate here in a little bit, just from a uh, flowering standpoint. Now, for mature orchards, it's totally different. The locomotive effect, we want to maximize fruit quality, number one, and fruit quality when I talk about is primarily size and color to a lesser extent soluble solids, and maximize yield. We want to maintain, maintain tree health, shading, and diseases, and those sort of things, which is why I say you don't need to, to go in and make a tree, excuse me, that's obviously too vigorous, even more vigorous, and set yourself up for a summer pruning problem. Did I do it again? Okay. Um, and so the mature orchard strategies, and this is, this is a number that sort of changed, folks. If it would have been 2.6 to 3 for moderate nitrogen. But we've, we've upped that number. Scott recommended this right before he left. Uh, and it didn't, it didn't get a lot of play, but, it, but Scott has done so much outstanding work in this arena over the years that I, I wanted to include it here. He's up to 3.3. And that is because three is about ideal, but because of these seasonal differences, kind of like I showed with fruit size potential, the tree, if you gave this tree 100 or 200, whatever your fixed rates are year after year, there's going to be some this depending on seasons. And so we see being a little over fertilized, being closer to three is probably better than being closer to that 2.8. Because if you go below 2.6, you're going to have potential for reduced size and yield. So if you, if you aim for 2.8, you're going to have some years where you're at 2.6. But if you aim for three, you're almost never going to have years where you get 2.6. You want to have moderate to high potassium. That's a little bit higher. Instead of 1.2 or 1.3, Scott, up that to 1.5. Um, yes, sir? percent in the leaf. What are the percentages? Those are the percent in nitrogen in the leaf, percent potassium in the leaf. And this is because there's kind of an interact, there isn't kind of, there is, <laughs> I don't know why I always say kind of, or I don't even know why I always say always, but I do. There's an interaction between potassium and, and nitrogen. So if you get, so, so this might be the nitrogen fruit size improvement curve, for, you know, if you got not enough and, and it get, but when you add potassium to it, there's an interaction and the curve goes from this to this. And, and so, so there are some of these things. And so that's kind of why we've upped the uh, number to 1.5. And these are California numbers, you know. So, so again, I think they're close. They're, they're, they're probably very close, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't testify in court, obviously, that they are the absolute uh, uh, knee plus ultra for anywhere, for anywhere else. And we want moderate boron, and boron has become sort of the, uh, it's become the soup du jour for much of California based on work done in, in, in uh, uh, almonds. We can talk about that in a second. And you can see other elements I've, I've kind of underplayed. Okay, now we've, okay, that killed that anyway. Now I can't advance. So, that's all right. Nope, not with this or the computer. Oh, that's what I forgot to do. Yeah, that's the one we wanted. Okay, we need, to, okay. So low nitrogen and high, and this is why I talk about fruit quality. You can see a tree that's inherently high in nitrogen, it might be a little bit bigger at any given, but you tend to have a duller finish in terms of nectarins that are, that are very finish, you know, they're kind of like apples in terms of their shininess with a high cuticle layer and not fuzzy like a peach. So they illustrate these things pretty nicely. <clears throat> I'm fairly con yes, sir. Well, we'll talk about that. So the question is, what? How do you apply them? We'll talk about application. I think this now is is more a shade effect than I do a pure nitrogen effect. And, and so again, and we talked a little bit about this at dinner last night, corking some of the things you experienced here this summer, or some of the growers here experienced. Russeting issues like that are often a case of a tree being out of balance, despite my dislike for that term, where what happens is a tree is so competitive that shoot, growing shoot tips can outcompete fruit and or they cause fruit shading in either a more humid or a less light rich environment. Uh, and so I have seen it happen too many times where if you do, if, if, if you're going to err, you want to err on the side 
of too much nitrogen, but making an extra summer pruning trip or two. Some pre-harvest summer pruning or some, some suckering at fruit thinning time, that sort of thing. And because again, those numbers we just talked about, 2.63, 3.3, you're always going to be better off with a little more nitrogen and proper light than proper light and not quite enough nitrogen. So hopefully that, that makes sense. And, and this sort of illustrates the, the locomotive effect. You can see this is a trial Scott did, uh, started in, in 82 really, fall of 81. And you can see no difference in, in really the fruit size in 0, 100 all the way up to 325 but but after about oh whatever that is you know a couple of years you're beginning to see a break but after 10 years or so nine or ten growing seasons anyway was only then that you really started to see the effect of no nitrogen kick in and so this is this is kind of nice really so if you had a bad season you know and you can't afford or you want to cut back on your fertilizers this is a place you can cut back you know Save your money for pruning and thinning the next year or, or whatever it might be. And because you're going to, you know, if your trees are healthy, they're going to maintain because that locomotive is going to keep going. Okay. And, and it's the same, you know, yield is, is a little more affected just because if you don't have enough shoots to regrow your tree or, or enough power to regrow your shoots every year, you might drop off and yield because you don't have enough places to hang fruit. But you can see just a moderate amount of nitrogen gave the same results after 10 years as high nitrogen, okay? And that just kind of illustrates with a, with a less colorful variety how you can turn a fairly yellowish or reddish yellow, I guess is the proper way to put that into more of a yellowish red variety just by backing off. And so these are tricks growers will play and that's why there's never an absolute right number for everything. You know, I talk to growers all the time, we'll put 80 on this one and put 140 on this one and put 160 on that one. Advantages are per acre, yes. Okay, so again, you've got this, but in general with the lower around 2.8 to three, you know, you're going to have better size, early maturity, same size and yield. And if you have very high nitrogens and you manage light properly, you'll have, you'll have, you know, same size and yield, but you'll tend to have poor fruit quality unless you're really diligent on light. But that's the next talk. And this is, again, where people tend, this is the nitrogen uptake by mature peaches at any given time of the year for, for you know, and so you can see they don't take nitrogen up as well. They only take up about 10 units per acre in the spring and they're taking up more than that in, in you know, the middle of early, whatever, late spring, summer, and they're still doing pretty good in the fall, up to late fall. And so this is part of the thing where you want to fertilize in the fall. And uh, to me, the timing, it'll still pick it up. The timing is not as critical as the total amount. So I, you know, there's some growers that will like do a 60-40 split. And I, I do a 75-25 and I do a 30-30, I mean, and more important is the absolute number. So that 150, yeah, you're going to have a more efficient application if you split that up twice or even three times. But in general, if you take leaf samples the following year, they're all going to result in the same thing. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of what I'm talking about, even though I say the need for post-harvest applications August and September, in, at least for us, you know, again, I'm not an expert in winter kill and those sorts of things. We were talking a little bit about this last night at dinner. So these are things that might, you know, contribute to that in places that are a lot colder than we are. Um, so I would, I would stick by your local recommendations for that. Zinc deficiency, you know, these are photographs of zinc deficiency with a little leaf. And we spent a lot of time chasing, chasing zinc. But the important thing about this slide is just look at these two because they illustrate the same thing that sun exposed leaves have lower zinc than proximate shoots in the dark in the shade anybody want to guess why that is the answer is up there on one of the other shoots yes sir and the, and, the, and his answer was metabolized through photosynthesis oh, probably but what it is, is it's a dilution effect. You can see it on this water sprout, you know, sucker in the, in the tree. You can see it being 33% here, whatever that is, 16 or 17% at the tip. 
it just tends to be diluted. So the more growth you have, the lower in general your zinc is going to be. And so here, a sun exposed shoot is more vigorous and stronger. And so it's going to dilute this zinc. And the highest zinc is down in the shaded part of the tree. And this is why it's important, guess what, to sample the same kind of shoots every year. Because depending on if you've got a short person out there in terms of how we started, the relativity of short versus tall, you got a short person taking samples, they might be high, and if, or yeah, and if you've got a tall person taking samples, they might be moderate or low, okay? And this is why you should keep in mind zinc. Deficient tree, sufficient tree. Look at the bloom type and density and advancement on February 17th, a week later. The deficient tree, the sufficient tree, a week after that, or eight days after that, whatever it is. You can see full bloom, many more flowers, and same sort of thing here. So the number one symptom that we should care about as growers for zinc deficiency is flowering quality and quantity for the next year. And when do flowers differentiate? They differentiate, say, in July and August of the pre... So flowers for, that are going to be coming a spring differentiated in July and August or began differentiating in July and August of 2017. This is why if you've got light flowering, you should look into putting zinc sprays on that time of year rather than what you'll do now. I know and this is what we do in California, although we've stopped in a lot of places. Most of the growers I work with don't do it anymore. Putting on these fall or leaf fall zinc sprays. Yeah, you fix those numbers in that slide, but you don't fix this problem because those flowers are already differentiated. So this is why I talk about criticality of timing. So something, something to keep in mind. Yes, sir. Uh, it 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 begins there. You, and this is one of those. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good things. When do, is is July a better time than August, or is June a better time than that? Probably, one of them is better. But but doing one any one of those is so much better than getting caught up in analysis paralysis and, and not doing anything. And, and again, I'm not a zinc expert in, in Utah by any stretch. I am, I, I guess I am, people say I am, so I'll claim it in California. But um, yeah, I, I tell people put it on, I, I tell them put it on on the 15th of July, frankly, why? Because if you tell somebody to do it on the 15th of July, they've got a hundred other things to do and hopefully it gets done by the 15th of August. And, and if you tell them to put it on the 15th of August, it won't get done until the 15th of September. So calcium, we were talking about this last night. Calcium sprays in terms of decay uh, did not help in terms of post-harvest decay. So you'll frequently hear, oh yeah, you had decay. Well, put on calcium. We'll strengthen your fruit after harvest. We've done a lot of calcium work over the years. Firmness at harvest, no effect. In fact, you know, there's no effect. I mean, the zero calcium control, calcium chelate, calcium nitrate, calcium acetate, calcium carbonate, calcium plus, what is that? Sulfur and phosphorus, calcium, what is that? Carbonic acid and amino type calcium. None of them helped. I did a trial, I was telling folks at dinner last night, Scott and I, where we immersed fruit for 30 to 45 seconds in calcium solutions every two weeks for the first six or eight weeks of the season. We immerse them, okay? Not going by and spraying 50 or 100 gallons an acre. And we didn't see any effect on anything. Calcium is very hard to get in the fruit. Um, that said, if your trees are below, cal this is California, and we rarely if ever see this, but if you go below 1%, you can see it. So if you've got issues that you think are calcium, uh, That'd be sort of the number to look at. The part of the problem is a lot of this calcium work has come out of the South, which is a totally different climate than here in the arid West, like you folks and us. And their calcium, instead of being 1%, is about a third of percent, or maybe half a percent at best because of their climate. So just because you saw something work in Georgia or South Carolina, God forbid we won't pick on North Carolina, since that's where at least one member of the audience is from, don't necessarily think it applies to here. It might, but then again, it might not. So keep in terms these these physiological things. And so here's what boron deficiency 
looks like it gives you these small, nasty, ugly, ugly fruit and twig dieback and that sort of thing. But here's what boron toxicity looks like, which is my concern now in California with all this almond-driven work not being a fruit but being a nut. I don't know enough about almonds to know whether they're going to exhibit these sorts of symptoms. But this was, this was a photograph I took, if you know California, in the desert between the Central Valley on your way to Las Vegas, you go through a town called Boron. This fellow was farming peaches about 20 miles away from Boron. And he was following the same Boron program that the guy who packed his peaches in the Central Valley where I live, 120 miles away, where we have no boron in the soils, or very little. And he was wondering why his fruit kept cracking and softening and his leaves all kept falling off. And he had like 140 parts per million, 160 part per million boron. Remember I talked about putting on 30 or 40 or wanting to be there. So he had three or four times as much. And he was not, he, he's the only grower who's ever thrown me off his property. And I was glad to go. Okay, so boron is mobile in some species and immobile in others and, and so so keep those things in mind. So you put it on apples or peaches or plums or any of these fruit that we grow, and it's going to move pretty quickly. And, and, but keep in mind that the disease is worse than the cure, uh, and, and this shows it as well. And this is why we're talking, you know, and this is a dormant shoot sample now rather than a leaf, because Scott really thought that was a better place to sample because you can now decide whether you need to, by taking a dormant shoot off a tree, you can decide whether you need to spray it bloom to help with set or some of those things. And you can see the curve break down when we get above 20. Your fruit set goes down, in fact, which is exactly what, but, but these are now leaf, summertime leaf samples, and this is why we did the break at 30. You can see sort of this boundary line effect that plateaus right around 25 or so. So you want to be in that range, but you certainly don't want to over fertilize with boron. I'm not going to talk about iron deficiency because you folks all know what it is. We don't have good cures for it. I think the ultimate cure there is going to be like they have in most iron deficient areas of the world, Italy and France and Spain, is going to rootstocks that just pick up iron better. And, and I throw this in, it's arsenic toxicity. Um, you see it in Washington. We see it in California because people that used to farm cotton where they sprayed MSMA, monosodium methyl arsenate, as a, as a weed killer in cotton 20 and 30 years ago that stuff and they do it year after year after year that stuff can build up in the soil it's a heavy metal and this is why you know i don't like seeing people put on on repeated doses of heavy metals unnecessarily and you'd be surprised how many of these mixtures if you're not buying say zinc sulfate but you're buying some zinc blend that has a whole bunch of other things it won't necessarily have arsenic in it i've never seen one that does but it might have other things that you, that you don't want. So if you're going after a problem, target it with that element. Don't target it with a mix. I mean, if you know you've got zinc deficiency, put on zinc sulfate or put on neutral zinc, but don't put on a mix of zinc, boron, calcium, magnesium, molybdenum. You get the point. So there's Lulu, my smallest dachshund, and, and, and let you uh, take a break or